Hello, Sanctuary Church. Hope you're doing well. I uh, hope this July you are indeed able to play and pray. That's what we're trying to do in July as we look ahead to August. Um, most of you should know me, but if not, I'm Tim here in uh, the city and um, looking forward to continuing Gideon on with us. I wanted to start off with a, with a uh, quote by A.W. Tozer. He says, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity we plan to do only the things we can do ourselves. And in many ways, I think that's the story of Gideon, or at least one of the lessons that we uh, are, are, are gleaning out of this passage uh, from Scripture, um, just that God wants us to do, and has called us to do things that are really beyond our capabilities. Like, we can't do them on our own, and yet God has called us to these things. And so, he, just like he called Gideon to incredible things, uh, and Gideon was nervous and afraid and cowering in a wine press, um, when God finds him and yet God comes after him and uh, he really does some amazing things. God uses him to accomplish his purposes and we're praying that God would use us uh, to accomplish his, accomplish his purposes in San Francisco and do incredible things through you, through you in this city. God wants to do incredible things. And so, uh, we're going to look at Gideon chapter 7. If you've been following along with us, you know, I mentioned Gideon um, is found by God, an angel of the, the Lord, and he's called out and, and, and he's given an identity, you, you mighty man of valor, you mighty warrior. And Gideon resists that. I'm from the weakest tribe, I'm the youngest, and but God keeps pursuing him uh, and uh, wants him to go and, and face the Midianites who have been oppressing his people for seven years. Um, and so uh, last week, Glenn led us through this process where his army is whittled down from tens of thousands down to 300. Um, and now he's supposed to go fight the Midianites with only 300. And it says, you know, they are as fast as, you know, sand on an ocean, the army that they're, they're fighting. So crazy stuff, impossible stuff. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole passage today. Um, but if you can, just pause this video. Uh, go read Judges chapter 7. I'm going to start, uh, I believe it's in, yeah, verse 9 to the end of the chapter 25, uh, verse 25. So Gideon, sorry, Judges 7, verse 9 to 25. Should take you literally three minutes to read. I timed it. Pause this, read it, come back. I'll be waiting for you. All right. Hopefully you were able to read uh, the passage. But let me summarize what happened. So after the army was whittled down to 300, Gideon's scared again. And God um, calls Gideon to go actually survey the camp of the Midianites uh, that he's about to, you know, especially engage. Um, but he, uh, God promises that he's going to encourage him in this. And as he goes down, he overhears this conversation about someone who had a dream about this loaf of bread smacking into a tent and demolishing the tent and another person interprets that as saying oh that's the sword of Gideon we're gonna win God's given us the Midianites to win this battle and Gideon is encouraged um, tremendously and then he summons up the courage to call everyone out into battle so that's the first part and then there's a second part of the passage we'll talk in a bit um, but I'm just struck by this passage I mean how relentless the pursuit of God is to Gideon. I mean, we've already mentioned he was pursued by the angel of the Lord. The direct um, words of God himself pursued Gideon. Gideon made an, a sacrifice and covered it with oil. And then God demonstrated through a miracle. He, he caught that, God caused that altar to burn on fire, that offering to burn on fire, um, showing that this truly is God. When God calls Gideon to tear down his family altar, his family idol, he's afraid that the villagers and his family, his own father, would kill him. And miraculously, his father actually stands up for him. It's like, that's interesting. God met him there. 
And then God, and then Gideon wanted another sign, and he asked God to send him a sign through the fleece incident. Not just once, but twice, God met him again and again. And so you see this Gideon almost trying to get out of this, like, oh, is it really you, God? Yes, it's me. And then after he whittles the army down, again, God comes to him. Not, this time not speaking to him directly, this time not a miracle, this time not answering a prayer, but just through a dream that's given to someone else that's interpreted by another person that Gideon just happens to be there to overhear. And yet God speaks to him through this incident, this conversation. And I just think if you read the whole story of Gideon, it is I mean, one of the major themes is God's relentless pursuit again and again and again of Gideon. And I think oftentimes we think we have to summon up the courage to go pursue God, we have the energy to pursue God, the holiness to pursue God. And there is some of that where we, yeah, we do need to pursue God, but the reality is through the breadth of scripture that it's, it's really not us that pursue God. It's God that pursues us right? I mean, it's God in the Garden of Eden after the first sin. He's the one walking the garden. Where, where are you, Adam and Eve? Yeah, it's God who, you know, uh, go, leaves the 99 to pursue the one lost sheep. It's, it's God who hikes up his robe when he sees the prodigal son coming in and runs after that prodigal Son, it's God in Revelation who says, I stand at the door and knock. I want to come in to dine with you and you with me. And I think so many times God is seeking us. And, it, it, you know, there are times when God is quiet and he's hidden and it's a mystery. The dark night of the soul kind of stuff. The hiddenness of God where you're seeking and seeking and seeking. And for whatever reason, there isn't anyone answering on the other end of the line. But I think uh, oftentimes God is speaking and we're just not wanting to hear. We're just not actively listening. I remember um, three years ago, about this time, uh, when God first called us to San Francisco. And it was actually Kelsey, uh, my wife, who God spoke to. And we were here in the city on a baby moon and I remember going uh, to Alamo Square Park, and um, we had a fight. I said, "Are you are you serious? Do you know Do you know how much it costs to live here? Like, no way. Like, we can't we can't do this." And we had a fight about it. But she's like, "I just think God spoke to me." And I went home, and and then I started seeing all of these things. God gave me dreams, and He brought to mind prophetic words that were given in the past, and even. Almost a year prior, we had heard Tom and Josie share at a conference about the vision of sanctuary, and I just inexplicably started crying. And if you know me, that's that's not me. All of these things, God, 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 almost audibly speaking the word sanctuary to Kelsey three different times, and just all of these things. And God had been speaking for years, and even He continued to speak. And it was like, okay, I, I just wasn't ready to hear it. I just wasn't listening but it gives me great courage to know that god called us here you know and and when things get tough when there's a pandemic you know i get up and get on my knees and and say this wasn't my idea god this was your idea you called us here let's do something you know fix this um give me strength give me perseverance give me something because i'm weak god and this was your idea and i just think um, man, as I was reading this and reflecting on this, just I used to like write down the things that God would speak to me, whether it was a verse that really stood out or a word or something. And I, I've really been out of practice and want to start doing that again of like keeping that journal, the things that I think I sense God speaking to me, the, the coincidences that aren't really coincidences, um, and just like trying to listen because. Because I, I believe God is, is speaking to us. He's, he's a pursuing God. Um, so maybe that's a takeaway for us during this July. Where is God speaking to us? What does he want to do? I mean, I don't want to be a part of something that we do in our own strength, right? Like We need God to speak. And, and if, if God is speaking, you know, we can expect 
so much fruit to happen because it's it leads me to my next point it's not us it's doing it it's god and so if you continue on in gideon and i know we're going quick here but there's a lot to cover but this is a famous battle where um, gideon divides his troops into 100 each three different um, groups and they surround the army at night they blow their trumpets they break their jars and there's a lamp and there's so much confusion in the camp they think they're being attacked that the Midianites actually attack themselves and 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 therefore the Israelites and Gideon's army is able able to win just only with 300 and it's so interesting to me um, that uh, that there was no weapons used, no swords used. I mean, it was really done in a way that it could only be explained by God, right? And this is actually a pattern you see throughout Judges and even beyond. I mean, in chapter 3, the Philistines are defeated not with a sword, but with a, a cattle prod. You know, in earlier in, in Judges in chapter 4, the Canaanites were defeated with a mallet and a tent peg. Just simple tools you know here their def- midianites are defeated with trumpets and jars in chapter 9 abimelech is killed with a millstone a flour grinder you know with samson it's a donkey's jawbone with david it's a pebble earlier jericho's walls fall down what with trumpets right um in egypt the egypt's chariots were defeated with a raised staff and i think over and over and over in scripture you see this um you see this trend of god using ordinary things instead of weapons um and i just think it's really interesting i think it points to a couple things a of course we've already hit on it it's god's power it's not just his pursuit but it's his power that he wants to work through us none of that could have happened (laughs) uh you know without without outside intervention without god meeting but I think, too, it points to this um, idea in Scripture that, you know, if you fast forward to the world that's to come, the world that we'll live in forever as heirs to the kingdom of God, there's not going to be armies and generals and commanders. It's going to be filled with workers and craftsmen and artists. Um, it reminds me of that, that uh, Scripture in Isaiah that the swords will be beaten into plowshares. A a, a tool of war will be turned into a tool of farming. And um, I think think this is just, if I can have some creative license, this is just a little bit of pointing forward to God's kingdom is upside down. It's different. And we get to look forward to that where in Revelation it says there will be no more tears, no more sadness, no, no more war. Hallelujah right? God's kingdom is different. And so I think this is just a little bit of foretaste. And I'll end with this. I think the ultimate place you see that is on the cross, right? Jesus uses tools he would have been very familiar with as a carpenter to defeat the greatest military power the world has ever seen, the Roman Empire on the cross, right? The tools that Jesus has used, a couple of planks of wood, hammer and nails and he defeated not just rome and turned that empire upside down but death itself and that's that's it in a nutshell god is pursuing us and he wants to use his power through his victory it's not up to us we just get to participate in it so i think this summer can we rest in god's victory can we really rest in what God has done, and his assurance that he is going to finish what he starts. And then can we lean in a little bit and see how is God pursuing us in his story? How can we participate? Where where do we jump in and get to sign up for what he is doing? Thank you, Sanctuary Church. I hope you have a great summer. See you.